it's about a Christian identity. Um, and many of these churches, I don't want to say all of them, but many of these churches and religious groups are desperately trying to hold on to what their view is a sort of an authentic American identity, which means for them Christian and European in origin, white Christian. Um, and because of that, because that is really so central to what they are trying to do, it's very difficult for them to engage in dialogue with people who actually would agree with them on a whole lot of things but who don't fit their model of what an American is. Now that's, that's a very general statement and I know that there are some many exceptions to it for sure, but I think that's, that's the reason that they're not very interested in dialogue um, and, that, and, aren't, and maybe are not likely to be until we get over this identity crisis as what is an American. But this is what you see played out in the public arena all the time, this business of having the Ten Commandments in a, in a courtroom or something like this. Um, interesting, by the way, forgetting, I mean, this great desire to have the Ten Commandments because this is supposed to be a Judeo-Christian country, right? But I'm sure you're all aware that if you go to the Supreme Court building, that in addition to, Nag uh, um, I'm sorry, his name escapes me, Hammurabi, the great lawgiver of, of, the, of, of Assyria, you also find a, a portrayal of Muhammad as a lawgiver. Um, so the, the enlightened, those Enlightenment Americans that, that formed the Supreme Court and were interested in, in law were able to have a much broader view than the people who want to just place the Ten Commandments in there and claim a Judeo-Christian heritage. Hope that's helpful. Yes? My question is about the relationship between prejudices and Americanism. This has something to do with identity as mm -hmm. well. Uh, you have been to many Muslim countries, and uh, there is there are some prejudices uh, with regard to dress in mm -hmm. these countries. Uh, of course, there are similarities between the prejudices that we have here in this uh, community and Muslim community. But specifically in Southeast Asia, isn't it due to uh, the uh, nationalist narrative of the colonial state? Yeah. Um, well, yes. Um, I mean, that's a short answer. In Southeast Asia and Indonesia and Malaysia in particular, it is. Um, and, but those countries represent two different, very different ways of formulating that narrative. Um, I don't want to refer to my own work. That's bad practice. But I just, wrote a, I just wrote an article that was published in Muslim World in the fall of this year on narrative identity in Malaysia, uh, Islamic narrative identity in Malaysia. Um, and let me explain the difference between them. Um, in Indonesia, uh, the understanding w has been consistently since the Dutch were kicked out in the 40s that all Indonesians were participants in the anti-colonial movement. And therefore, regard the, national narr the, the narrative of national identity is not associated with religious identity. Um, even the strong Islamist groups in Indonesia don't deny that Christians and the few Hindus in Bali are real Indonesians. Okay, um, it's a very different situation in Malaysia. Malaysia, um, of course, parted company more peacefully with the British, um, and the British tried to set up very consciously, as did the elite leadership of the different racial communities in Malaysia, a nationalist narrative that would say that the Chinese and the um, Eurasians and the Indians and the Malays all together formed this new nation and would share its power. But there was always another narrative which said that the Chinese and the Indians and the Eurasians and particularly the Christians were colonial collaborators and that only the Malay Muslims really opposed colonialism. Okay. And those two narratives have run side by side and contested in Malaysian history constantly. Um, and, uh, and that um, has created an enormous prejudice which associates the non-Muslim populations of Malaysia with colonialism, in fact sees them largely as a product of colonialism. They wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for colonialism and therefore a problem. Now they've tried, different governments in Malaysia have tried, I remember one year, 1988 or something, the, the national slogan, they always had a slogan and a song every year. Uh, 
the national slogan was nationalismus terus per paduan, nationalism creates unity. And the idea was that nationalism, rather than religion, right, it didn't catch on. So it's a contested narrative there, and you're right. It's, it's the, the colonial thing is a big part, as, as it is, I think, a, um, I think it's fair to say across the Muslim world, the association of colonialism with Christianity and with Christian missionaries um, has meant that these new nations as they're born, it's very frequently difficult for especially Christian minorities um, to associate themselves with a nationalist identity because they're seen as colonial products. Um, and that's a big internal problem for Christians as well, how to be members of a new nation and not relate, you know, not keep relating to stuff. Anyway, whole books have been written about that, including one that I wrote, so we won't go into it. But you're right. And I, but I think that affects places like Pakistan and other places as well. Thanks, sir, and up the question and answer session. Um, we are very glad having you here, Pastor Ham. Thank you. And also how glad we are. Uh, we want to give you a gift as a token of appreciation. Ah, OK. <laughs> and I would like to invite uh, Dr. Akinji. He's IIB. Um. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Resident scholar. I'm sorry. 